joining us today. I thought you guys was being entertained by this amazing music playlist that I had. So I'm over here having a good time and I'm realizing none of you were joining in on the fun. So I apologize that you weren't able to hear the playlist. Um, but thank you uh, for, for joining us and welcome to our annual Juneteenth presentation. Uh, today we have a fantastic guest and we cannot wait to introduce him to you. Please note that we will have a special session from 1 to 1.30 for a more intimate Q&A with our speaker. However, don't forget to post your questions in the chat and our committee will manage to chat and share the questions with our speaker during our session. Additionally, uh, please don't forget to complete the evaluation at the end. Your feedback provides us with critical information needed to improve our professional development experience and provide uh, us with suggestions for future learning and engaging opportunities. We will make sure we share the link in the chat as well. I am Danielle Harrison Green. I'm the chairperson of the African American Black Employee Resource Group and the Institute Director for Human Development and Relationship with University of Wisconsin Madison Division of Extension. I want to take some time to reflect on the history of Juneteenth. Juneteenth, officially Juneteenth National Independence Day, and also known as Jubilee Day, Emancipation Day, Freedom Day, and Black Independence Day, is a federal holiday in the United States commemorating the emancipation of enslaved African Americans. It is also often observed for celebrating African American culture. Originating in Galveston, Texas, it has been celebrated annually on June 19th in various parts of the United States since 1865. The day was recognized as a federal holiday on June 17th, 2021, when President Joe Biden signed the Juneteenth National Independent Day Act into law. Juneteenth's commemoration is on the anniversary date of the June 19th, 1865 announcement of General Order No. 3 by Union Army General Gordon Granger proclaiming freedom for enslaved people in Texas, which was the last state of the Confederacy with institutional slavery. This symbol in front of you is the official Juneteenth flag. And let me uh, give you a description of that flag. The star, uh, the white star in the center of the flag has a dual meaning, Haith said. For one, it represents Texas, the Lone Star State. It was in Galveston in 1865 where Union soldiers informed the country's last remaining enslaved people that under the Emancipation Proclamation issued two years earlier, they were free. But the star also goes beyond Texas, representing the freedom of African Americans in all 50 states. The burst um, outline around the star is inspired by a nova, a term that astronomers use to mean a new star. On the Juneteenth flag, this represents a new beginning for the African Americans of Galveston and throughout the land. The curve that extends across the width of the flag represents a new horizon, the opportunities and promise that lay ahead for Black Americans. And the colors, red, white, and blue, are the colors of the Juneteenth flag, and they echo the iconic colors of the American flag. These three colors appear on the Juneteenth flag as a second declaration of independence. Black Americans from the former slaves to their living descendants were and are free Americans too. So while Juneteenth is a celebration of Black freedom, the holiday isn't just for the Black community. Juneteenth gives people an opportunity to reflect on what it means to live in a country and in communities that say we value individual rights, we value freedom, we value freedom of the press and freedom of speech. And if we value that, we need to value that for everybody. Please visit Aberg SharePoint site and visit our calendar of events if you would like to read more about Juneteenth.
So thank you again for sharing your lunch hour with the African-American Black Employee Resource Group. Aberg's purpose is to serve as a resource for and foster current and future African-American colleagues' success by sponsoring programming, providing collegial support, encouraging belonging, and raising a collective voice related to issues that impact employees' ability to thrive personally and professionally. And we love your feedback again. Um, so again, we will make sure that we provide a link to you. And before we introduce our speaker and share his bio, I do want to acknowledge our committee member leadership. Rhonda Brown is our co-chair. Quintella Perry is our secretary for our new secretary and our new co-chair. Catherine Borg Smock is our new treasurer. James Bowling and Eva Terry our co-chair memberships and retention committee, and Carla Williams is the co-chair for marketing and media committee. We do have a, pretty much a shared leadership role for our professional development committee, and that's with Jenny Abel, Aaron Conway, Monica Lobenstein, and Heather Quackenboss. So, Without further ado, I want to introduce to you Dr. Mark Barnes, who will present today on Unleashing the Power of Geographic Education, a captivating presentation that will combine place-based storytelling with cutting-edge geospatial technologies, including GIS. By intertwining these powerful tools, Dr. Barnes aimed to foster critical understanding of the cultural, economic, political, and environmental landscape that encompasses and extends beyond our nation's borders. Dr. Barnes is a geographer and historian. What is geographic education to a people, says Dr. Barnes. This question drives Dr. Barnes as a standalone geographer at Morgan State University, which is otherwise known as the national treasure in Baltimore City and beyond its borders. Morgan State University was founded in 1862, it's a historically Black university, um, and it's, it's considered and classified by Carnegie as a high research institution and one of the top five historically black universities in the country. Dr. Barnes research and teaching interests involve institutional decision making on weather hazards and disasters, institutional vulnerability, urban economic redevelopment and geospatial innovation. Dr. Barnes' approach to geographic education and research elevates the idea that the heart requires just as much nourishment as the brain does for a person to develop themselves holistically to be of good service to the broader society. He enables greater environmental awareness as well as personal growth through a geography framework that honors the discovery of new ways to envision as well as visualize unfamiliar physical and social worlds for equitable stewardship as well as familiar um, environments. Dr. Barnes has established university-wide information exchange hubs at Morgan, most notably the Environmental Workgroup and Geospatial Collaborative, whose members represent humanities, social science, and STEM disciplines. He is advisor to the Geo. Graphical People Society, a student-led organization whose mission is to use geospatial technologies that inform their peers about environmental matters of severe cause and consequence to those of African-American descent. Dr. Barnes is a national counselor for the American Association of Geography. He is a proud Philadelphian and life member of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. And without further ado, I would like to turn this over to Dr. Mark Barnes. Wow. Um, thank you for that extremely uh, warm and lengthy uh, <laughs> introduction, Dr. Hairston. Uh, you actually still, you did the entire presentation. Thank you. I appreciate you. You're welcome. Yes. Just send a check in the mail. Anyhow, how is everyone today? Good. Okay. Excellent. Wonderful. Uh, this is going to be part uh, presentation uh, and part conversation, hopefully, right? So um, I'm still on a sort of high. Uh, we finished up classes uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and so I'm still 
uh, on a bit of a high, and I'm a bit dressed down today, but I still have my Morgan swag. Uh, as Dr. Harrison said, uh, 1867, uh, we were founded, uh, and we have been growing, uh, particularly now, um, at unprecedented rates of uh, development, uh, not only in our campus infrastructure. So I'm inviting everyone uh, from Wisconsin uh, to Baltimore. Uh, to see the great work um, that we're doing at Morgan State uh, relative uh, to our building and that their capacities, uh, but also the programs that are just booming um, at this very moment. Uh, so you have an open invitation. As you know, geography, travel, hey, come on over. All right, so you know today what I wanna do um, is I, I do want to sort of change uh, the conversation uh, a bit uh, about uh, geography uh, from what many of you uh, may uh, be familiar with. Number one, uh, there are black other black geographers. <laughs> um, I am not the only black geographer. Uh, we are a rare breed though. Uh, however, uh, the numbers uh, are increasing uh, in terms of representation uh, in the field, and I'm extremely uh, excited about that. Uh, and the fact that there are now, so this is uh, just a, a website from the American uh, Geographical Society, otherwise known as AGS, which is based in New York City. And we're gonna visit New York City uh, in just a little bit. Uh, and also as Dr. Hairston mentioned, um, the uh, American Association of Geographers, uh, which I've had uh, sort of the great fortune of being associated with ever since I was a college student uh, at Westchester University, um, so my undergraduate alma mater. And just to see that there are new, younger um, people um, who are coming up um, to uh, engage in the field uh, in ways that, you know, I could not have uh, imagined. So I'm incredibly uh, excited about that. So uh, without further ado, I want to um, go to uh, New York, uh, in fact. And you might say, hold up, Dr. Barnes, aren't we talking about Juneteenth? Why are we in New York? Why aren't we in uh, Texas? Well, the way my brain works um, is perhaps a little bit different uh, from most uh, individuals uh, when it comes to you know, thinking about people uh, and thinking about places. I really am huge on making uh, connections, uh, establishing relationships, not only between people um, and places, but also a variety of media like film, television, uh, and the like uh, to better sort of illustrate or display uh, sort of these uh, principles of geographic as well as spatial concern. Uh, and as all, many of you all know, uh, just last week uh, here in the Northeast, uh, we had um, an issue uh, with um, smoke. Uh, smoke uh, resulting from the wildfires um, that were raging uh, in Canada. Uh, that smoke um, got blown, right? So if you were in my weather and climate class, we would talk about uh, this uh, matter, uh, if you will, both in the physical sense matter uh, with regards to pollution, as well as the sort of political, economic, cultural uh, dimensions um, that uh, that particular that pol uh, pollutant matter um, has uh, visited uh, upon um, cities uh, across uh, or throughout the East Coast. However, when I look at this image of New York City blanketed uh, with smoke, I really just can't help to think about the whiz. I know you might say, "Well, Dr. Barnes, what are you talking about the whiz?" Well. If you're familiar with the 1970s version of The Wiz and with starring Michael Jackson and Diana Ross and Nipsey Russell, not Nipsey Hussle, 
for the younger um, folks in the crowd, but Nipsey Russell, at the end, right, the grand finale of the Wicked Witch of the West, right, Eveline, uh, has this big musical production. And that was like the emancipation, right, the freedom when she got sort of flushed down the drain, uh, if you all remember. And after that, there was this washing away of the soot and dirt uh, that had been become collected as a result of her rule, okay? And so when I was looking at the smoke and looking at New York, I'm like, wow, that just looks extremely uh, familiar. So as I was preparing uh, for this presentation, I said, well, maybe I can use this um, to perhaps expand uh, and also broaden um, our conceptions of not only uh, Juneteenth, uh, but also geography as a scientific uh, field to study for emancipation. Now, of course, I'm not gonna read through this. And at the end, actually, I will uh, provide Dr. Hairston uh, with the link um, that can be shared. So that's my gift to you um, for inviting me to participate uh, in what is an extremely uh, important conversation. Uh, but when I think about you know, Juneteenth and, and these geographies, I have to like go back to sort of my introduction to geography course uh, that I uh, do at Morgan State University, where I have to actually at the very beginning demystify what geography is for most because it's been trivialized. It's been trivialized by game shows like Jeopardy uh, and then also in uh, history, and also social studies classes, right? So the teacher points to a map and says, this is the geography of the place that we're gonna talk about, right? And then they leave it right there. Geography is so much more than that, right? Geography um, is filled with adventure and travel, journeys and all of that. And so hopefully today I can instill uh, in you an appreciation or a broader understanding of this scientific uh, field known as geography that I was introduced to at the ripe old age of about 20 uh, or 21 at Westchester University. Uh, and so in thinking about sort of, you know, geography, I think also about <laughs> um, my PhD experience uh, at Rutgers uh, University. Uh, and those of you who have gone through uh, the doctoral um, process know that you have to go um, through uh, the uh, actual presentation, one of your dissertation idea, but even before that, you have to go um, through a sort of, I, I would call it like an interrogation process uh, where you um, are made to share with your committee members uh, the different topics um, that you might be covering. And one of the topics one of my committee uh, members gave me uh, during that period was um, the five themes of geography. And I had never known, I had gotten through a undergraduate program, a master's program in urban studies at Temple University, and then a doctoral program and I was hit with this question of what are the five themes of geography, okay? And in thinking about that, and I said, well, maybe I can use these five themes um, as a framework um, for enabling a conversation um, about sort of these different geographies. There are multiple geographies and certainly subfields two branches of geography, both the human and also the physical branches that have sort of these subfields, be they urban, economic, um, environmental, or otherwise. And those lenses allow for a visualization of actual site location of um, Juneteenth um, expressions, uh, if you will, but also uh, situations that we can have a conversation uh, about. So thinking about that, right? 
in terms of these three, oh, I'm sorry, these five uh, themes of geography, place, location, um, human environment, interaction, uh, and the like, you know, I think about place names and place names um, really actually have sort of a, um, I have a deep appreciation for place names, uh, certainly in my heart. Uh, because one of the questions uh, in my intro uh, to geography class, I, I do pose um, to students. And in fact, I don't even call them students anymore. Uh, to me, they are investigators and explorers. And that's for a really intentional purpose. Because I think when you call people students or you label them as students, that creates sort of this sort of passive learning. I want action, right? So I look to stimulate action. Um, investigators do things, explorers do things. Um, students, they just party, right? Uh, and they're hand in late work all at the end of the semester. So I get them to reconceptualize and think about um, sort of their purpose, all right? And when I think about that, I also think about uh, Genesis 2.19, right? When Adam is naming all of the animals uh, in um, paradise, he's bestowed uh, with that gift and that's an incredible amount of power, of power given to one individual. And so the name Juneteenth, you know, is a, an invention, right? It's an invention, right? It's a place name, right? It's a place name that does speak to, as Dr. Hairston said, identity, gender, political affiliation, uh, and more. And when you think about this notion of names, right, the idea of naming, right? You know, there's great power in that, but also there's significant disempowerment, right? And that's captured uh, in the book. Geographers love everybody. We love economists, we love political scientists, historians, we like folks uh, over in psychology, we like folks over in uh, architecture and planning, engineering. We talk to everyone. Very few people talk to geographers, but that's okay because we like everything, right? So taking from or borrowing from, rather, I don't take, we share. <sighs> Thinking about Freakonomics, a book uh, written by um, an economist and also a journalist, we like them too. Uh, that book details a study that was conducted about naming, right? And the study focused on uh, employment, uh, employment um, hiring practices of human resource professionals. And what the study revealed or found was that um, there was implicit bias uh, in hiring. And some of you may uh, be familiar uh, with this study uh, in relationship um, to the names that appeared on resumes. And so if we think about that, we can think about also how the idea of Juneteenth might be um, conceptualized um, as well as interpreted by people in different places not only here across the United States, but also in other parts of the world. There may be some associations, right, that are able to be made by some. And on the other hand, there are likely disassociations when it comes to what Juneteenth means. And so thinking about that, we can think about, you know, how Juneteenth situates us. Right, that's a geographic uh, principle. Um, how that name, that place name, situates us in particular, in a particular time, uh, and also place or context. Right, and we don't have to remain in the past, right, because things are uh, unfolding um, at this very moment 
with regards to Juneteenth. And so when we think about that, we can think about you know, the multiple meanings uh, that Juneteenth has, uh, not only perhaps in Texas, but also here in Baltimore, uh, in Gainesville, Gainesville, Florida, uh, over in Los Angeles, uh, and so on, and of course, Wisconsin, okay? And so, you know, these meanings, and we have these sort of different approaches towards this notion or idea of Juneteenth, which has become so broad in a very, very short, very, very short period of time across a number of different places and spaces. So as I was sharing with Dr. <laughs> Harrison, I was having some difficulty, uh, tech technological difficulty, uh, and so this map, and we got to have a map, right, um, isn't as vibrant at the moment, but when I give the gift, uh, it will be. Um, but the map um, looks at data. Let me just click on one of these points. Oh, here we go. Oh, that's okay. Go to Brooklyn real quick and click on this point. Okay. So this map was uh, created uh, using data uh, that um, I extracted uh, from Eventbrite uh, and a number of other uh, sources. Uh, I had a really just a basic question. Um, what Juneteenth events um, are happening uh, in uh, New York City? And New York City was chosen um, for a reason. And New York City um, is uh, constituted for this particular effort of the several boroughs, including Manhattan, the Bronx, uh, Brooklyn, and then also uh, Queens. Okay. And so this information that you see here uh, that I extracted from Eventbrite um, just gives us information um, about those events, okay? And this is what I used uh, to actually pull together uh, the presentation, right? That was driven by the data. Like I always tell my students, it's the data that drives the narrative. So, why New York City, right? Why New York City locations? Again, one of our five themes. Why New York City, right? Well, New York City allows for time and opportunity, which I didn't have a lot of uh, towards the end of the semester. Uh, and I've been working on some other projects uh, since then, because really what I wanted to do is look at sort of regional differences like the deep South and the Midwest and the great Northwest and so on and so forth. However, New York City due to its sheer magnitude and size and people of all sort of racial and ethnic uh, backgrounds, cultural backgrounds uh, and the like, it provided um, the uh, opportunity uh, to look at Juneteenth uh, perhaps in a, in a very contained uh, yet uh, sort of uh, grand uh, way, uh, if you will. Uh, and certainly as a symbol of freedom, uh, when we think about the Statue of Liberty, that you know, this uh, particular place um, is iconic to sort of the idea, um, the ideas that Juneteenth um, and its organizers espouse. Also, New York City is what is con considered to be um, a global city, um, a global city that has great political, um, cultural, as well as economic influence uh, and the like. You have some uh, supranational organizations. I actually just a couple weeks ago, uh, was in New York City, and I guess that's what kind of was driving sort of this idea of using uh, New York City, where I attended 
the permanent forum uh, on the people of African descent at the United Nations. And so I'm sitting in uh, the United Nations, one of those conference rooms, uh, and looking at all the different cues of uh, Black folks, my people, uh, from around the world, from Rio de Janeiro. I mean, it, it, it just was awesome. So, you know, the fact that, you know, New York City, you know, presents, you know, such a picture, uh, not of a melting pot, but a kaleidoscope of brown and black hues, okay? And so lastly, just understanding again from my hazards background, the notion of um, environmental risk uh, and also impact associated uh, with extreme, uh, extreme events like Hurricane Sandy and the most recent uh, wildfire uh, situation uh, there. So, Juneteenth is a kaleidoscope of Black culture. And as Dr. Hairston actually uh, mentioned, um, Juneteenth is for all peoples. Um, and I thought that there's no other or better way, and I'm not going to show the video. Uh, because I know that we may be short, short on a little bit of time. And actually, I can do this for like two or three hours um, if you all let me, because I'm just so excited. But this video, this drag ballroom scene uh, in HBO's Lovecraft Country, um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, this was a production uh, with Jordan Peele uh, and Misha Green uh, that looked at the horrors inflicted on black bodies uh, by agents of white um, supremacy and also uh, people of color uh, themselves. Um, and this one scene um, or one episode actually, um, there's a confrontation between a son uh, and the father as we prepare for Father's Day. I'm a father uh, myself. And so that's why I wanted to, to get this in. Uh, and then looking at sort of some of the challenges um, that uh, fathers, sons uh, face um, in, a, in, in a variety of contexts. But I wanted to also share this uh, with thinking about uh, Juneteenth um, as a means um, to like really think about the corporeal experience uh, that uh, many uh, have um, associated uh, with their uh, emancipation, um, perhaps by others, or their emancipation, sort of their self-driven emancipation. Uh, geographers, and getting back to geography, because I'm going to keep coming back, because I think that's extremely important. Um, geographers are really concerned with the corporeal or the bodily um, experience, especially uh, when uh, we think uh, about uh, sort of feminist geographies uh, and the like. And so geography looks at sort of this broad um, sort of human uh, experience. It's not just uh, concerned, well, actually it's really not too concerned uh, with uh, the elevations of mountains or the depths of water bodies. And so, thinking about sort of this notion of movement, bodily movement, whether it's restricted um, or is allowed, right? We see that in uh, many of the events. Also in thinking about this notion of movement, um, or we can talk about diffusion, um, is the celebration of food culture that Juneteenth uh, provides. Uh, and some of you may be or may not be familiar. If you're not familiar, I will encourage you very strongly uh, to take a look at the Netflix um, documentary series uh, entitled High on the Hog, um, How African-American Cuisine Transformed America. I was fixed. Um, I watched all of the episodes, the new season. I, I'm not sure if the new season it's only two seasons, 
uh, came out. Um, but I was like transfixed on the uh, on, onto the to this TV screen. Why? Well, part of that um, series um, actually was located um, or focused and featured um, the birthplace of my mother. Um, she was from uh, lowland country, South Carolina, Geechee, um, love rice, I love rice. They, they focused on uh, rice production uh, in Charleston, which is a huge industry, right? And so here's the economic geography part, right? And so in thinking about sort of Juneteenth, it's celebration uh, and also com commemoration and tribute to those, you know, whose, whose bodies um, toiled uh, in marshes and then also the sugarcane fields in Haiti and, and other places. You know, that, that movement, that, that sense of, um, or that idea or, or that dream of freedom that one day, um, they uh, would be uh, free, um, extricated, if you will, um, from uh, servitude, uh, permanent servitude. And so when I think about uh, Juneteenth, I think about you know, my mother and, and all of those who um, came out of those um, sort of food um, cultures and, and, and transported um, their dreams, their hopes, uh, I think about even going back to uh, Lovecraft country where one character talked about sort of her dreams and hopes, you know, for the future, the future of her, her grandson um, and the things that she did to help bring about that future. And that's what Juneteenth um, truly um, is all about. Um, in addition to transporting other cultures like uh, music culture and the like, like jazz, which is a purely African-American uh, invention, uh, of course. Uh, and then of course, other sort of notable uh, tributes to movement, right? To movement um, from film screenings and award galas uh, and the like. And so the neighborhood, right? And I'm taking this, this is a page out of my uh, new, uh, introduction to geography course where I have students uh, go into neighborhoods here in Baltimore City um, and conduct explorations of built natural and social environment features. Why do I do that? Again, movement, right? Getting folks to um, explore and discover. And we can discover so much uh, about um, who we are, um, who we were, and who we are becoming actually uh, when we get into uh, neighborhood communities uh, with an eye towards discovering, right? Not only discovering ourselves, but discovering others. And W.E.B. Du Bois, um, who's actually a hero of mine, uh, who wrote uh, The Philadelphia Negro, a social study, uh, you know, much of that work. Um, is predicated uh, on his uh, past achievements, especially thinking about the souls of Black folk, and thinking about the souls of Black folk when Du Bois talks about, you know, sort of that, that two-ness, right? You know, these warring ideals, if you will, between what it means to be American and what it means to be Black. And I think Juneteenth um, actually pushes the envelope uh, on um, that, that notion. And so thinking about even sort of these neighborhoods, right? Um, and all of their distinctiveness, um, they really just gives us a great opportunity, even when or after the Juneteenth celebrations are over. And I think that's what we have to really consider. It's not just about for a day, right? June 19th. And I know some organizers do activities um, based on uh, the study on, on the light research that I did um, for a week or so, but we really need to start considering and thinking about how we engage with neighborhoods, um, the people within them, those environments, 
and, and the like because they have significant causes and consequences. And we saw this during the pandemic um, where we can actually see certain neighborhoods, especially here in Baltimore City and other cities as well, uh, many large urban uh, centers with high populations of African uh, Americans and also other people of color, where the disparities that we saw were so great, so high uh, within their neighborhood uh, communities. And we know that's a consequence and that's a result of redlining um, practices, very racist housing practices um, that actually currently are still, um, their effects are still unfolding, especially when thinking about climate change, right? And it's getting hotter in cities, right? So that urban heat island effect uh, issue, uh, if you will, um, impacts um, people of color more greatly due to the disinvestment, um, the capital um, disinvestment, um, and actually those barriers uh, resulting again from, from, from redlining uh, practices uh, in those neighborhoods. And so thinking about Juneteenth uh, in that way uh, is certainly uh, key and important to future, uh, to future progress, progress around equity uh, and justice matters. Uh, and so thinking about that, you, you also have to consider uh, when we think about sort of this idea of ownership and belonging. Uh, and this is a video that you'll see Christian Cooper. Some may recall Christian Cooper. Um, he's the black man um, who uh, engaged uh, with a, uh, what they would call a Karen. Uh, that is a place name uh, if, if there ever was one. Uh, and thinking about sort of, you know, the idea of um, restricted movement, right, um, in neighborhoods, especially um, in natural uh, environments like um, parks and, and the like. Uh, and those of you who may recall, uh, Cooper was um, stopped uh, while he was bird watching. And um, that just provided, again, evidence. And that's not the only incident. There are tons of incidents um, from New York City all the way to Oakland, California, uh, if you will, that show sort of this ongoing uh, restriction of Black bodies in public spaces. Also thinking about, so that's the idea of belonging, the idea of ownership and looking at the data, uh, seeing the types of venues um, and gender questions of ownership, right? Who owns, again, going back to sort of economic, um, sort of urban geography, uh, if you will, uh, and what ownership uh, may entail. And then finally, so we could have the conversation, thinking about Juneteenth as a means to better understand our relationship or perhaps lack thereof um, with weather and climate matters. And when I say weather and climate matters, I'm talking about certainly the physical dimensions, right, um, temperature, uh, rainfall, uh, and the like. But I'm also speaking about the human dimensions, right? Thinking about policy, both public and private um, policy uh, that um, can actually exacerbate or amplify um, exposures um, to, to those material uh, matters. And we see that uh, in a number of places and of course, I can think about um, Hurricane Katrina. I've already talked briefly about Sandy, but also water toxicity in Flint, um, here in Baltimore, Jackson, Mississippi, and elsewhere, All right? And so thinking about, and I'm just gonna bring this part up uh, here as I close out this presentation, you know, thinking about Juneteenth, you know, as an application, again, using a geographic, a perspective or spatial perspective uh, even. Um, thinking about Juneteenth 
two as an application, right? You know, bringing those two together. And as I said, in terms of geography and Juneteenth and thinking about, you know, Juneteenth expanding beyond just the day, June 19th, expanding beyond, you know, a week, 52 weeks, right? 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? And mainstreaming the idea of Juneteenth in all we do, right? And I think by doing so, you know, and thinking about geography in that respect, right? It really does matter. It does really matter in terms of the perspective, the tools that we use because we can actually identify, we can make visible the actual invisible. My students do that, love them for that. But the visible um, or the invisible, you know, sort of built natural and also social environment effects, right? That cause harm, particularly to African peoples, not just in New York City, not just in Baltimore City or in Madison, uh, Wisconsin, but around, around the globe. So again, I wish to thank uh, Dr. Hairston uh, for allowing me the opportunity um, to speak to you about a topic that I really, really love and that's geography. <laughs> Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Barnes? I didn't check the chat. Any questions? No questions. Um, again, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, there will be um, time um, at the closing of this uh, uh, space with uh, Dr. Barnes for you to have a more intimate Q&A with him. So if you chose to stay on um, beyond this uh, hour, um, this 12 to 1 um, time, you can, and we will chat it up with him uh, a little bit and be able to ask questions. So I'll scan the chats once again, just to make sure there's no questions. I do have one question I wanted to share, Dr. Barnes. Like, how do you get, you know, our, our young people to get excited about um, geography and placemaking and history and the way in which you shared it when so much in K through 12 especially has in terms of history, cultural identity has been muted and almost like, you know, watered down that's kind of shifting our young people's desire to even like, what, what's the point when all of this information is coming to us so false? You know, like how do we get them excited about like getting in and telling their own, you know, narrative? Thanks for that question. Um... My response is you meet them where they are, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So, um, for example, uh, at Morgan State University, uh, students in my introduction to geography class uh, are given uh, the opportunity, right? I always say geography is choice, right? And so they can select um, a neighborhood uh, that they're most interested in that appeals to them. In fact, I even say uh, to them that Morgan State University um, is a neighborhood uh, in and of itself. In fact, uh, Morgan State University has a number of uh, neighborhoods contained. It has commercial districts. Um, it has um, residential places. Um, and actually, even when you think about it, some uh, in industrial areas, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so the students, who choose Morgan State University and some who are from Baltimore or other places who wanna learn more uh, about Baltimore City, uh, they engage in such a way where you know, the discoveries that they make keep them connected and keep them engaged. In fact, right now I'm in the process of collecting the data 
um, from their projects, their exploration projects um, to, uh, for, for publication, okay? And, you know, the discoveries that they made, like one student um, said that she didn't really even know that. And there's, there's actually um, a stream that, that runs through Morgan State University uh, that she discovered. Another one in terms of natural environment discoveries said, you know what, I'm interested um, in uh, the landscape architecture around campus. And she inventoried all of the various plant um, species at Morgan. And then they got a different view, right? Um, they have a different and also more clearer view of their future alma mater um, than what they had prior to uh, the course. And then I think when we're talking about sort of K through 12, uh, actually today, right after this presentation, I have to run. Uh, my, my youngest daughter, uh, she's um, participating uh, in a promotion, their promotion ceremony. So she's going from the eighth grade to the ninth. When we're talking about younger people in middle school and also high school, I think it's the same thing. You have to meet them where they are. In fact, I recall helping my oldest daughter with homework uh, that she had back in like first grade or so, uh, where she had to uh, take uh, a look at uh, businesses. And, and this is first grade. I was like, wow, um, businesses within uh, the neighborhood. And uh, she chose McDonald's. Why? Because she liked chicken and fries. <laughs> <laughs> she, liked, she liked chicken nuggets and fries, right? So that's what she connected to. You have to meet people where they are. In fact, as I mentioned, I don't even call students students. I call them investigators, also explorers. I don't even really talk about geography. Um, I don't even use the word. Why? Because geography eh, is not that sexy. <laughs> In fact, again, place name and where we place, you know, a, a term like geography, right? Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that earlier. In fact, geospatial is a much sexier term. Mm -hmm. You know, folks say, oh, geospatial, what's that, right? Technology, but, but guess what? It was all, it all developed out of the field of geography, mm -hmm. right? And so when we are talking about geography, I really use the word just like in terms of climate change during my dissertation work, when I went in um, that focused on uh, transportation uh, or transit management under extreme weather um, and also climate stress, uh, when I spoke to the folks, so I, my, my site study was Philadelphia and um, I interviewed uh, managers uh, at the Southeastern um, Pennsylvania Transportation Authority and the first day when I walked in talking about climate change, they, they shut down. They didn't want to talk about climate change. However, um, it's called SEPTA, the acronym. Um, they were really quick to talk about how heavy snowfall, the frequency of heavy snowfall events, um, the um, heat related impacts to their equipment and infrastructure, all of those things, right? They have been impacted by, right? And this goes back to that sort of that economic geography and where their investments um, uh, were taking a hit across the system, across the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority. Um, uh, I'm sorry, across the um, Southeastern Pennsylvania from Philadelphia and also its outlying uh, suburban uh, areas. They could talk about that, but climate change, because it's so politically charged, that's not something they, they, they wanted to or perhaps felt that they could, could, could talk about, but they talked a great deal about those impacts. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Any other questions? Let me see. Okay. 
Well, I don't see any questions coming up. So I will just take this time just to kind of reflect on what we were talking about today and, and close us out. So thank you, Dr. Barnes, um, for spending this time with us uh, this this morning, this afternoon. Um, and, you know, one of the things that uh, stuck out like in this last portion of your conversation is bringing sexy back to geography so that's what you know we're going to focus on how can we bring sexy back uh to to uh this whole idea around geography um and and getting our young people interested um on behalf of aberg and our colleagues friends and partners of the division of extension we hope we can call upon you to continue to engage us in meaningful dialogue and i just want our colleagues that are logged in and our friends from all over the country that's logged in to to remember um, a couple pearls that I would like to share with you. Um, one of the things that I gathered from your talk was that placemaking is really about the people, um, although that there may be buildings and streets and natural amenities, um, the people are what make a place feel special um, and different. Um, and then thinking geographically is especially um, important to, to, to individuals of color and particularly um, African American uh, individuals. And so we want to keep that in mind when we're talking about geography and placemaking. Um, and then getting, um, getting our kids to get excited about history and geography and culture and its intersection um, is to meet them where they are. And uh, that's critical important to kind of start to grow that list of amazing geographers that you shared with us earlier um, today. So I want to thank you for sharing that information and sharing um, those pearls. As a reminder, oh, go ahead, Dr. Parnes. Oh, you're, okay, go ahead. For the audience here, mm -hmm. um, geography, as I said earlier, is intertwined. There's nothing that you all do, mm -hmm. right? You, you don't do anything in the vacuum. Space, place, location. Even with the University of Madison and something we're gonna, in the next few weeks, um, pursue is how do you, the question is how do you manage operations? How do you manage facilities? Right? How do you manage programs across the university? You have to have an understanding of place. You have to have an understanding of space as well as location. So geography is not something that's divorced from you, mm -hmm. right? It's, you live with it every day. You just don't know it. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, and so my thing is to, bring the geographer that's already in you out, right? You think this way every day. As soon as you wake up, I'm going to get to work because you might, there might be a traffic accident mm -hmm. and you got to take another route, right? Um, even thinking in travel uh, all, all, every day. And, and I know I said in terms of maps, um, you probably saw a map at least five times already today. And certainly during the pandemic with John Hopkins dashboard, you saw the numbers of affected persons from COVID and you saw the number of inoculations and all that. Guess what it was put on the map? So geography is not something how, how, how do I put this? Geography is where you, where you are every day, every minute, every second of the day. Um, when you take time and take a step back, right, and think about that, you know, in your everyday dealings, the, the pictures, uh, the sounds of a geography, the tastes of geography, um, the smells of geography will become more apparent uh, to you. So I just wanted to share that with the audience. Thank you for sharing that, I appreciate that. 
Um, and seeing no questions, I'm going to go ahead and, and close out again, Dr. Barnes, I want to thank you for coming through and representing the Morgan State University, the national treasure. I had a whole debate and argument with someone the other day about the, the national treasure in Baltimore because we were talking about Howard University and he's like, oh, here we go. So, <laughs> And I was like, no, I'm not trying to take away your crown. Um, and so it was a really a great conversation. We, we but have a conversation about national treasures in my work around HBCU vulnerability to uh, climate change impacts and thinking about national treasures in Washington, D.C., like the historical, like the monuments, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with historically Black colleges around um, the country, uh, especially those uh, within uh, the uh, sort of the, the Northeast and and also deep south along the eastern seaboard, uh, their fates will might might likely be similar. And also Howard has gone through this too. And we could talk, have that conversation. I like that that conversation with that person. Mm -hmm. But their fates might be similar to Xavier University, a Dillard uh, University, um, and also Southern University that felt the sting of Hurricane Katrina to the point of near closure. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so when no one is talking about that, again, a geographer is bringing attention to that issue when it comes to sea level rise for institutions like the University of Maryland Eastern Shore mm -hmm. or Hampton University uh, and also Hampton and several others, right? Mm -hmm. Even in Florida, right? And we saw that uh, with, uh, oh my goodness, uh, the name escapes me right now. The one with Ed Reed, I can't remember the name. Anyhow, um, but that's a huge issue for not only HBCUs, but other minority serving institutions like um, Hispanic serving uh, institutions and also tribal colleges. Thank you for that. And um, if you guys would like to um, read uh, Dr. Barnes' um, bio, it can be found in our SharePoint site. We have we created a, a new tab specifically for Juneteenth, so check that out. Um, the recording for this will be available as well, as well as previous recordings of other, other Juneteenth events and Black History um, Month events. We hope that you have enjoyed yourself and will return for our future lectures and upcoming series in the fall. Um, so look for a Zoom registration soon, and uh, uh, Jenny has placed the link for the evaluation. So please, 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 your feedback is really important to us. So take a, a few minutes, just two minutes to create. Uh, um, complete the evaluation. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined this live discussion today and those who will be watching the recording. Thank you for taking the time to watch the phenomenal discussion. For those of us who will stay logged on to have a more intimate Q&A uh, with Dr. Barnes, hold on tight. Otherwise, everyone else have a wonderful afternoon and see you soon.